You're listening to Beyond You, exploring faith, culture, and higher education, a podcast from Oklahoma Wesleyan University. Welcome to episode 29 of Beyond You. My name's Aaron. I'm the media director at Oak Woo and a producer for this podcast. Thank you for listening to the show. We hope these conversations add value to you. We want to let you know the end of season two is coming up next week. We'll be taking a short break during the summer to work on bringing you more engaging conversations and helpful content on this show. We have something special for you today, a little different than our usual interview. We were privileged to have former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine visit our campus recently to speak to our students and community members. Under his leadership, NASA launched the Artemis program. Jim Bridenstine has also represented the state of Oklahoma in Congress, where he was a member of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. It was an honor to share an inspiring evening with Jim where he spoke about space exploration and the importance of faith to the astronauts at the Apollo program in historical moments of the space race. We wanted to share a recording of that evening with you today on Beyond You, and we hope you'll find it as inspiring and enlightening as we did. Thank you for listening, and here's Jim Bridenstein. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Um, I- I'm going to talk for a few minutes about um, about space, quite frankly. So it was it was correctly identified that I had the opportunity to run NASA for a period of, of Trump's administration. Um, it was an honor of a lifetime, and I will tell you, it wasn't without its challenges. Uh, I'm glad that I did it. Um, I came from the House of Representatives, for some of you who might be interested. I know there's at least a few political science majors in here. Uh, how, did, how, did, how did all this come to be? I, um, I ran for Congress uh, back in 2012. Um, I served on the Armed Services Committee in the House of Representatives Strategic Forces Subcommittee, which oversees all of our national security space capabilities. And then I also served on the Science Committee. One of the subcommittees of the Science Committee is the Space Subcommittee, which oversees NASA. And I chaired the Environment Subcommittee, which oversees NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Some of you here in Oklahoma care a lot about weather. Um, and, and a lot of people don't realize that about 40% of NOAA's budget is space-related activities. So when I was in the House of Representatives, I was working a lot on space activities, so much so that I eventually drafted my own very comprehensive space reform bill called the American Space Renaissance Act. And it was, uh, it, it was a very, it, it touched every committee in Congress. So for the political science majors in here, what does that mean? That means it has no chance of ever becoming law. So we had provisions in there for, like, if you launch your satellites on an American rocket, um, you get a tax, a tax credit. Well, that has to go through the Ways and Means Committee. How many people, which is the, the, the committee that writes the tax law, how many members on the Ways and Means Committee care anything about space or access to space or launch? They just don't care. We had provisions in there for insurance, for people to to get more confidence about investing in and flying in space. And those insurance provisions have to go through the Financial Services Committee. How many people on the Financial Services Committee care about space? Not very many. So so the, the reality is it was so comprehensive, it touched every committee in Congress, which makes it almost impossible to get a bill like that through. But it became a repository for the best space reform ideas that I thought our country needed to enact. And whenever a bill did come up that we knew was going to pass, maybe it was a, a, you know, a National Defense Authorization Act, maybe it was a transportation authorization, maybe it was a, a defense appropriation. Whatever bill was coming up that we knew was going to pass, we would take provisions of the American Space Renaissance Act and we would pack that bill with everything we could get the committee chairman to agree to uh, before, before it went to a vote on the floor. And even on the vote on the floor, we would then offer amendments to get as much of this legislation passed as possible. Little did I know when I was doing this, I was doing this because I thought space was very important for our country, and the intent of the American Space Renaissance Act was for the United States to remain preeminent in space for the next 50 years. Um, Little did I know that one day this work would result in me ending up um, as, um, you know, the NASA administrator, which was never on my agenda uh, when, I was, when I was doing these activities. Um, I, I think a, a couple of, I, I, I'll 
maybe open up to questions later, and you guys can ask me more about those types of activities. But I want to take us back in time. So take us back in time to the 19, I'm going to go back to the 1950s, as a matter of fact. A lot of the young people in here need to hear this story. We're talking about a time when the United States of America and the Soviet Union were in a great power competition. And of course, we were competing for an ideological agenda. You know, um, we decided that it was important to go and prove our technological prowess as a way of demonstrating that our political and our economic system was superior to that of communism, of the Soviets. That was the intent. We're going to demonstrate that our technological prowess is a direct result of, of our free market capitalist society, which is very different than that of communism. And so we got engaged in this space race. And guess what? When it started, we were losing. We were losing bad. So, some people in this room, maybe in the back left corner, some people in this room remember Sputnik. Sputnik was a little satellite that uh, was about the size of a basketball, and it had some wires coming out of it, and it made little, little beeps. And that was it. That's all Sputnik did was it made beeps. But here's the thing. If you can put something into orbit, this is what the Soviets did. They put Sputnik into orbit. They were the first. If you can put something into orbit, you can probably also take something out of orbit. And if that thing that gets put into orbit has nuclear weapons on board, they can attack us without warning. Instantaneous, our days are over as a nation. Sputnik scared America. And so we got engaged in de de you know, developing and launching our own satellites. And of course, those satellites eventually became communication satellites and a whole bunch of other things. But in the meantime, Sputnik was first. And the Soviets also beat us to orbit with not just a satellite, but a human. Yuri Gagarin was the first person in space from the Soviet Union. You know, a lot of times we talk about Alan Shepard, the first, they call him the first free man in space, that kind of thing. To, to be clear, Alan Shepard was after Yuri Gagarin, and Alan Shepard went straight up and straight down about 120 miles. Yuri Gagarin was not only first, and they didn't go straight up and straight down. He went and he orbited the earth. And then he re-entered after orbiting the Earth, re-entered at 17,500 miles per hour, and his capsule, as it re-entered, it eventually was falling straight towards the Earth, and he ejected out of the side of it and landed safely with a parachute and survived, became a hero of the Soviet Union. So now the United States, we were not first with the satellite, we were not first with a human in space, and we were not first with a human in orbit in space. We're behind. And in this, in this time, John F. Kennedy came to Congress in 1961, May of 1961, and he gave a speech. This was, not, this was not a State of the Union. He called a joint session of Congress to declare that not only are we going to get ahead of the Soviets in space, but we're going to land a person on the moon and we're going to bring it back to Earth. This was about two weeks after Alan Shepard went straight up and straight down. 120 miles straight up, straight down. John F. Kennedy comes to the floor of the house, and he says, we're going to send a man to the moon 240,000 miles away. We're going to bring him safely back to Earth. People said he's nuts. This is incredible. It can't be done. It's not technologically achievable. It's too expensive. We put almost 5% of America's budget into the Apollo program in order to get ahead of the Soviets in these days. Now I'm going to fast forward. Some of you remember Apollo 1, where we lost Gus, Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Ed White in a fire. It was, it was really just a test. It wasn't a launch. It wasn't a flight. It was just a test, and they burned up. Um, quite frankly, because of a pure oxygen environment where they were operating, they burn up. These were three of the most famous astronauts, quite frankly, the most famous people on the planet at the time, and they burned up in a fire. And of course, given the fact that we're spending 5% of America's budget on it, people were saying we need to cancel it, this isn't achievable. 
If you look at the polling of the Apollo program in history, it was not a popular program. Of course, John F. Kennedy got assassinated, and then we had Lyndon Johnson come to power, and he was very keen on making sure we kept this program moving forward. And in this time, we eventually get to this moment where we're launching what was called Apollo 6. Apollo 6 was the first full test of a Saturn V rocket, the biggest, most powerful rocket ever built in human history. And here in the United States, when we launch things, we make it available for everybody in the world to see. It's on TV. And on Apollo 6, this was an uncrewed mission. Apollo 6, April 1968. Apollo 6 launches the Saturn V rocket. The first stage, April 1968, first stage of the Saturn V rocket, did what we call pogo. It shook so bad, vibrated so hard, that parts of the rocket fell off as people are watching it go into the sky. The second stage of the vehicle, there's five engines on the second stage. Two of the engines didn't even ignite but it's still going to space. It's just not going to achieve the velocity necessary to test the heat shield, which has to be tested in order to, to re-enter safely into the atmosphere after traveling super fast. Remember, when they come back from the moon, they're going to be traveling at 35,000 miles per hour. And when you hit the atmosphere, it's like hitting a brick. You've got to figure out how do we enter the atmosphere very gently and how do we have a heat shield to protect our astronaut. That heat shield on Apollo 6 could not be tested because two of the five engines didn't ignite on the second stage, and the first stage shook so bad, parts of the rocket fell off. Now we can't test the heat shield on Apollo 6 in April of 1968. And then this vehicle that, that's in space, there is a single engine on what we call the command and service module. The command and service module is the device that when we do this to the moon, it goes all the way to the moon. And in order to go to the moon, you've got to burn that single engine on the command and service module, you've got to burn it over and over and over again. You've got to burn it to do what we call a translunar injection. And then you've got to change courses on the way to the moon. Then when you get to the moon, you've got to slow down. So you have to do what we call a retro burn. Turn around, slow down, make the rocket fire the opposite direction. Then you've got to fall into orbit around the moon. And then you've got to circularize your orbit around the moon. This little engine has to be reignited dozens of times on a flight to the moon. Well, this little engine wouldn't reignite even once on Apollo 6. So this, was, this mission was, in fact, a failure. NASA never declared that it was a failure because we were in this great power competition, but it, it was, in fact, a failure. Apollo 6, April 1968. When that spacecraft came back to Earth, interestingly, the next day, the Soviets, we got intelligence that the Soviets were going to be around the moon, not on the moon, but around the moon, with humans by the end of 1968. We're in April of 1968. We had this terrible failure. The Soviets are going to be around the moon by the end of 1968, and NASA has to figure out what to do. By the way, when, part, when the command and service module engine fails, there is a lifeboat. Have you guys seen the movie Apollo 13, anyone? What, you guys remember what the lifeboat is? It's the, it's the moon lander. It's the device. The command and service module orbits the moon, and from there, there's a lander that goes down to the surface of the moon. That command and service module is a lifeboat, or that, that, that lunar lander is the lifeboat. If the command and service module fails, you can come home on the power and the propulsion of the lander itself. You're probably not going to go all the way to the moon and land, as they didn't on Apollo 13, but they're going to use that for power and propulsion to get back home. Well, guess what? In April of 1968, that moon lander doesn't exist. It's way behind schedule. It's way over cost. It doesn't exist. So if we're going to try to beat the Soviets to the moon at the end of 1968, we're going to have to do it without the lifeboat. If you remember Apollo 13, when there was a failure, that lifeboat kept them alive. 
NASA had to make a decision. Are we going to do this or are we not going to do it? And given the importance of this from a national perspective, NASA said, we're going to do it. And so they dropped the moon lander altogether. They just said, by the end of the year, we're going to the moon and we're not going to have a moon lander, <laughs> which means we don't have the lifeboat. They also, at that point, did not have mission control. They didn't have the communication networks to communicate all the way to the moon. They didn't have the avionic systems and the, and the, the instrumentation necessary to, to go to the moon. They didn't have the crew, quite frankly, because the crew had passed away on Apollo 1. So all of these things were, were in, and by the way, even if they had the crew, they didn't, they didn't have a way to recover the crew when they landed in the ocean. All of these pieces were missing, and yet NASA said, we're going. And so we're going to fast forward. NASA puts, and remember, America's treasure is being put to work here in a way that's never been done before, hasn't probably been done since, putting this treasure to work to land a person on the moon, and we're going to go by the end of 19... 68. Um, interestingly, if we're going to make that happen at the end of 1968, that puts our astronauts in orbit around the moon on Christmas Eve. What, what does that mean? That means if that single engine that has to reignite over and over again, if that single engine fails to reignite, our astronauts will be trapped at the moon for the rest of their lives, which at that point will be a matter of hours. And when you're in orbit around the moon for the first time in human history, Every person on the planet who has a television or radio will either be watching or listening to it. And by the way, when that eventually happened, one out of four people on the planet either saw or heard that Apollo 8 mission live. One out of four people on the planet. So here we go. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fast forward. I heard July of 1969. That was Apollo 11. I'm talking about Apollo 8. Apollo 8 is not the moon landing. Apollo 8 is the first time we're going to orbit the moon. And so, sorry for diming you out. Um, so here we are in, in April 1968. We make a decision. We're going to go to the moon. We're going to go into low lunar orbit. And then we're going to bring our astronauts home. And, and, and we put to, all of our treasure to work, and we make this thing happen, and we go. And in, in December of 1968, we launch for the moon with our astronauts, and by God's grace, everything worked. They're in orbit around the moon. It's Christmas of 1968, and they're going to communicate to the world. For the first time, humans from the moon are going to communicate to the moon. They're about 64 kilometers over the surface of the moon, orbiting. And they're going to communicate to the whole world, knowing that one out of four people on the planet is listening to what they say. By the way, if that engine doesn't reignite, they're, they're stuck at the moon. And it's going to wreck Christmas, not just for all of America, but for all of the world. NASA told them, say something profound. But by the way, when they make this communication, they're not communicating just to the world. Specifically, they're communicating to tens of millions of people behind the Iron Curtain. This is the uniqueness of what NASA has to offer. This is, this is a piece of information power which sets the stage for American greatness. And in, on December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1968, our astronauts had a message for the world. And I want to read it to you. He says, we are now approaching lunar sunrise. And for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was out without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. I want you to think about this for just a second. In the Soviet Union, celebrating Christmas was illegal. Being a Christian was illegal. Yet behind the Iron Curtain, people are tuned in. They're trying to understand what's happening right now that the United States of America is around the moon. And they have this opportunity to communicate behind the Iron Curtain. 
and they read from the book of Genesis. Jim Lovell. You guys know Jim Lovell? Uh, some people know him as Tom Hanks from Apollo 13. Jim Lovell keyed the mic and he said, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Then Frank Borman keyed the mic. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters, he called these seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. That was their message before they reignited that single engine that had to work if they were going to come back to earth. What an amazing opportunity, not just to speak to the entire world, but to specifically to a group of people where it was illegal to be a Christian and it was, in fact, illegal to celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ. Now, it didn't take much time. They came home. That single engine worked. They came home. Uh, they were, you know, put into quarantine for a period of time, and, uh, and ultimately they were um, treated as heroes, as they should have been. But they were also sued. Um, Madeline Mayer O'Hare, some, some people remember that name, maybe back up in the left. I, I'm getting a lot of folded arms back there. I'm just making sure they're listening. Um, so you got, so... So they, they were sued, and NASA, NASA, you know, it went to the Supreme Court, and it got thrown out, and nothing ever came of it. But now we're coming up on Apollo 11, July of 1969, where we're going to land on the moon. For the first time, we're going to land on the moon, and, and NASA is now very clear with its astronauts. Whatever you do, don't read Scripture, because we don't, we don't want to go through that again. Let me just tell you, you don't tell Buzz Aldrin what not to do. He will punch you in the face. Have you, have you seen the videos of Buzz, Buzz Aldrin punching people who say that the moon landing was fake? By the way, this is what they always say. The moon landing was fake. Which one? We landed there six times. We had 12 people, 400,000 people working on the project. Which one of the six were fake? By the way... The people who had the most to gain from it being faked <laughs> uh, were the Soviets, and they congratulated us on the project each time, and then they partnered with us on Apollo Soyuz. Um, so just so everybody knows my position, that is incorrect. It, it is very real. And I, I, see, I see some frowns from the young people down here. By the way, we're going back, and it won't be fake this time either. So, um, so Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are on the moon. We're going to fast forward to July 1969, and they told, told Buzz Aldrin, whatever you do, don't read scripture. By the way, when they landed on the moon in July of 1969, their orders were, <laughs> when you land on the moon, you've got four hours to take a nap. So you just landed on the moon for the first time in human history. Nobody's ever been on the moon before, and now you're going to take a nap for four hours. I'm just guessing that's not going to work. And in fact, it didn't work. So when they're on the surface of the moon, Buzz Aldrin decides he's going to communicate. And this is what Buzz Aldrin says. Houston, this is Eagle. This is the LM pilot. That's the lunar module. That's the device that goes down to the surface and lands on the moon. This is the LM pilot. I would like to take this opportunity to ask every person listening in, whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. Then he unkeyed the mic, but he kept talking. 
And of course, as he was talking, he knew that it was being recorded for all of human history. <laughs> and he read John 15, 5. As Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For you can do nothing without me. For the first time in human history, we have somebody on the surface of the moon. We are now in front of the Soviet Union. This was an accomplishment they had not and never would achieve. Maybe in the future one day, Russia might be able to do it. They still haven't. But here he is on the surface of the moon, and what he is acknowledging is, whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. A quote from Jesus. He's acknowledging this has nothing to do with me or the 400,000 people. None of this can happen without Jesus. And he reads that scripture. He also has with him a chalice that he fills with wine, and he has bread, and he takes Holy Communion on the surface of the moon for the first time in human history. Acknowledging that it's not his awesomeness that got him to the moon, it's somebody else's awesomeness that got him to the moon. Now they're coming home. He 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 you know they do their they do their number of hours on the moon and then they they leave and they they come home, they go back to the command and service module, and then they they launch off for for Earth. And uh and and Buzz Aldrin wants to thank the workforce for all of the work that they did to help him accomplish this task. And in, in, that, in that address, when he's thanking the workforce, he decides to read from Psalm 8, 3 4, through 4. Remember, they told, <laughs> told him, whatever you do, don't read Scripture. This time, he does it keying the mic. He's about to re-enter Earth's atmosphere at 35,000 miles per hour. I'm just guessing he doesn't care. Psalm 8, 3 through 4. When I consider thy heavens, the work of, the fing the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? A lot of you are familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope. You raise your hand if you're familiar with the James Webb Space Telescope. This is a device that is looking so far out in space, you're actually looking billions of years back in time. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope can see out in space, you know, 13.7 billion light years. It's a, me a measurement of distance. 13 point, if you think about how fast light travels, like just, you know, a, a mile. It's imperceptible. It travels a mile. Think about how far light travels in 13.7 billion years. That's a tremendous amount of distance that we're able to see. And if you go back to the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope gave us the first images of deep space. They call it the deep field view. What they did is they trained the Hubble Space Telescope on a piece of sky and they let it dwell there for 14 days. Now that piece of sky, think of if you, if you were to hold a penny at arm's length and look at that penny, you'd see Abraham Lincoln's eyeball. Like they're looking at a piece of sky that's the size of Abraham Lincoln's eyeball at arm's length, and they're, and they're dwelling there for 14 days, a, a piece of dark sky where they believe nothing happens to be. There's nothing there. We're just going to dwell right there. 14 days goes by, and in comes thousands and thousands and thousands of points of light. Each of those points of light is not a star. Each of those points of light is a galaxy with, on average, 100 billion stars. A piece of sky the size of Abraham Lincoln's eyeball. We've now done the same thing with the James Webb Space Telescope. Now it's not... Abraham Lincoln's eyeball, think of a piece of sky the size of a grain of sand at arm's length and training this telescope on that grain of sand for a period of time. And again, 
thousands and thousands of points of light. New points of light that we've never seen before, each of them not being a star, although there are stars in there from the Milky Way, but each of those points of light that are of interest are not stars. They are, in fact, each a galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars. So we now know that there's hundreds of billions of galaxies, each with a hundred billion stars. We think about the immensity of this universe, and I heard this a lot at NASA. People would say, how insignificant are we? How many times did I hear people say, you think about how massive everything, how insignificant are we? I want to read you again what Buzz Aldrin read on his way home from the moon. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, and the galaxies, how immense it all is, which thou hast ordained. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? The idea is this. We think about how immense the universe is. That doesn't testify to how small we are. It testifies to how amazing God is. And in, and in all of that magnanimity, all of that massive, amazing power, he still cares about every single person in this room, so much so that he became man, lived life here on earth as a human, without sin, the only person to ever do it, died on a cross to take our sins on him, and of course he rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's how much he cares about every person in this room, and the heavens testify to his glory. We are without excuse. Nature testifies to the awesomeness of God. It's in Romans. You can read it. We don't have an excuse. He is amazing. And yet he loves each of us so much that he's willing to do that for any one of us. As though, you know, he did it for all of us, but he would have done it for any one of us individually. I think that's an amazing testimony. And Buzz Aldrin's scripture that he read on the way home when he was told not to read scripture, every time we learn something in space that blows us away, I go back to that scripture because it testifies to the awesomeness of God and how much, even in spite of that awesomeness, he cares about each one of us individually. Thank you for listening to Beyond You. Let us know what kinds of conversations you'd like to hear by leaving a comment.